Hi, I'm Gary, and this is episode 188 of EV Musings, a podcast about renewables, electric vehicles, and things that are interesting to electric vehicle owners. On the show today, we'll be looking at the different mindset you need to drive an EV. This season of the podcast is sponsored by ZapMap, the free-to-download app that helps EV drivers search, plan, and pay for their charging. This particular episode is in partnership with EVA England, the body representing electric vehicle owners in England. See the show notes for membership details and links to their website. Before we start, I wanted to remind you all about the EV Musings newsletter, the top five EV or renewable stories in the last few weeks, alongside a couple of surprise treats each edition. Patreons at the All Access and VIP level get a free subscription to the paid version, which has additional news stories with commentary, a short editorial article each week, plus longer, more in-depth articles every other week. So why not become a Patreon and check that out? Or head over to the newsletter and sign up for the free version. The link is in the show notes. Our main topic of discussion today is the EV mindset. Now, I hear a lot of talk on the socials about how EVs are complicated, about how they need particular education to be used right, about how people won't change unless something's easier than what they're moving away from. Well, today, I want to examine that a little bit. There's a school of thought which says EVs should be just as easy to use as internal combustion engine cars. Well, I contend that they're easier. There's no gears. Uh, The braking is easier. You don't even need to start and stop many of them as it happens automatically when you get in or out of the car. Most of them don't even have a manual handbrake. How much easier can you get? But one area where there is a stark difference is charging. This is because everyone has years and years of experience fueling an ICE car and very little experience charging an electric vehicle. So I want to talk a little bit about the mindset you need to own an EV and why ICE isn't quite as easy as you might think it is. There's a perception that fueling a petrol car is simple. Pull up at the pump, swipe your card, stick the nozzle in the tank, fill the tr- pull the trigger until it clicks, replace the nozzle, done. Easy peasy, right? However, comma, there's quite a lot of rose-tinted spectacles about that utopian situation. It hides a multitude of aspects that are conveniently ignored with regards to petrol pumps and highlighted when it comes to car chargers. Because that sequence of events is just one possible combination. Sure, it's the one that most people encounter on a regular basis, but it's one of several. It's also the one that we've had more experience of doing than anything else. A question I often ask people, and indeed I asked the same question of Liz Allen in episode 184 a few weeks back is, when you first filled a car with petrol at a petrol station, or diesel if that was your choice, how did you know what to do? Who taught you? Because the fact is, nobody is born knowing intuitively how to fill a petrol tank. Did you know which side of the car your fuel cap was on? Did you pull up at the right pump at the petrol station? I mean, nowadays we have pumps that do diesel and petrol at the same unit, but it wasn't always like that. Did you know how to get the pump to start working? Were you at a place where you could pay cash? Or did you have to present some other form of payment? If you had to present some other form of payment, was it obvious how that worked? Did you know where to put the payment card? Did you know which part of the unit handled that part of the process? Did you know how much of a prepayment amount was taken from your card prior to pumping? I would contend that the first time you did this, you probably didn't. Maybe not the second time. Probably the third time you did. Then you went to another petrol station from a different fossil fuel company. Their pumps were different. Their payment processing was slightly different. Their layout was slightly different. Maybe they didn't have card readers on the pump at that location and you had to pay inside the booth of the shop. So given all the variables above and the unfamiliarity of using a petrol pump for the first time, let's take a look at the statement that filling with petrol is easier. Petrol stations are generally manned. There are exceptions, but this is usually the rule. And the reason for this is because some people like to pay cash. But furthermore, the person manning the tills is also the one monitoring the forecourt for issues. And I know this because I used to work at a petrol station in my youth. Things that you have to look out for. 
People allowing children to use the pumps. 16 is the minimum age. People trying to somehow jam the nozzles uh, open so they don't have to continually hold it. Uh, this is considered a fire risk in the UK. People spilling flammable fluids on the floor, which happens more often than you would imagine. People being confused about what to do to start the actual pump. And that's why petrol stations have both tannoy systems and emergency pump stops to manage and monitor this. On top of this, the so-called, quote, simple solution results in thousands of people a year misfueling their vehicles. Figures from the RAC suggest that around 150,000 UK drivers make this potentially expensive mistake every year. That's about one every three minutes. And in extreme circumstances, the repairs for this can be in the region of five thousand pounds. This can never happen in an electric car. On top of that, there are local differences with fueling. Let's take an American example. When I first went to the US, you could fuel and pay. In certain cases, after a certain time of day, you had to pay, then fuel. This involved going into the kiosk or store, paying up front for your fuel, and then actually pumping the fuel into the vehicle. This stopped people doing a runner without paying. In certain parts of the US, this is now the default. You pay before you pump. That means you need to know how much you can put in before you pay. It's no good looking to say, well, oh, putting enough to fill it, but I don't know how much that is until it's done, because that doesn't work. So you end up guessing what you'll need and paying in advance for that. And as the price of fuel varies so much, and in the last few years in the US it has varied considerably, it becomes very difficult. Then let's look at those drivers who have a special fuel card. All-Star is an example. This is mainly for fleets, and it allows the cost of the fuel to be paid centrally every month by recording the transaction against a card and settling everything on account. This, can, this is usually done in the kiosk by an individual who needs a signature, which is another reason why you need someone manning the pumps. Finally, we have the pumps themselves. There is a perception that petrol pumps are infallible and that they always work. Well, they're mechanical, heavily used in certain places, and believe me, they break down far more often than you would imagine. When I delivered groceries for Morrison's during lockdown, we had to fill the vans at the end of each shift. The store had an attached petrol station with six double-sided pumps that could, in theory, accommodate 12 vehicles at the same time. I can count on the fingers of one hand the number of times I went into that forecourt in 12 months and all the pumps were working. The upshot of this is queues, as people have to wait for others to finish filling on the reduced number of pumps. All these factors play into the statement that petrol fueling isn't actually easy and straightforward. It's just that we're used to it. Yes, when everything works, it's simple. But so is EV charging. I was in France recently, stopped at a charger I'd never used before for a CPO I didn't know, plugged in, flashed my roaming card, and it worked. From stopping the car to getting power from the charger, around 20 seconds. It's all about the mindset. Fossil fuel delivery systems have had 100 years to evolve and develop, yet we're still in a situation where the majority of pumps need live bodies to monitor what's happening. People need to go into kiosks to pay and get signatures for certain transactions. 150,000 people a year put the wrong fuel in their vehicle, and what works for someone in one part of the country with one petrol station might be completely different in another part of the country with a different petrol station. But EV charging is complex. And let's also remember that hydrogen fuel is subject to limitations as well. I'll link a video uh, in the show notes about a guy in California where there are more hydrogen stations per capita than anywhere else in the world, who traveled 20 minutes each way to find a station with supplies, waited an hour and 20 minutes in a queue with 10 cars ahead of it, so much for the three minute refill, hey? and had to try five times to get the system to work and ended up putting $130 worth of hydrogen in which gave him an air condition on range of just 300 miles. I also read something saying that nobody will move to a tech that's more complex and expensive than something they already have. Well, on the face of it, that would uh, seem to make sense. I have a solution that works for me. Why would I pay more to find a, a more complex solution? Well, let's consider the smartphone. Prior to the iPhone coming out in 2007, the typical new phone costs hundred pounds or so, maybe 200, work pretty much the same as your phone at home, but with the ability to text. 
It had a keyboard, tiny screen, a couple of built-in functions. Anyone remember playing Snake? Then came the iPhone. The interface was different. The form factor was different. The user experience was different. It had apps you needed to download. It had screens you needed to format. It couldn't cut and paste originally. And it cost well over double what existing phones cost. And you needed a completely different phone plan to accommodate the data aspect of it. Steve Ballmer from Microsoft is on record as saying, $500 fully subsidized with a plan. I said, that is the most expensive phone in the world. And it doesn't appeal to business customers because it doesn't have a keyboard, which makes it not a very good email machine. Steve Ballmer from Microsoft. Mm. Remember him? So the statement that nobody will move to a tech that's more complex and expensive than something they already have is clearly wrong. The iPhone proves that in a most emphatic manner. That form factor and user experience is now the dominant one when it comes to phones globally, all in pretty much a decade or so. People won't move to a tech that's more complex and expensive than what they've got if it doesn't offer them a benefit. Who needs to record off the TV? Nobody. But then we get VCRs in there. So now you've got VCRs. Who needs higher quality, crisper picture, better audio versions of their VCR movies? Nobody but let's get DVDs in there. So now who needs even better quality than the DVDs? Nobody, but let's get Blu-ray in there. Well, now you've spent your money on your VCR, your DVD and your Blu-ray. Let's get rid of all of that, stick everything on your computer using expensive Wi-Fi and streaming. Who would have imagined 20 years ago having to pay a broadband fee every month, an additional cost that's generally pretty necessary to do just about everything today? The list goes on. It's all about the mindset. The thing that's always thrown at EV charging is the infrastructure isn't there. And this is a general catch-all that covers a multitude of sins, such as there aren't enough chargers, to there are enough chargers, but they don't work, to there are enough chargers, they do work, but there's a queue to get to them. Well, as we've already identified with petrol stations, two out of the three of these issues also apply to them. There are pumps that break down and there are queues. Remember when the supposed fuel shortage occurred? <laughs> Cues, am I right? So let's address the issue that there aren't enough chargers. There are, per that map, 70, 70 plus thousand connectors across 24 plus thousand locations in the UK at the time of recording. Now, even if 20% of them are not working, that's 56,000 connectors available. But statistics also show that the chargers are only used on average about 16% of the time. So the statement, there aren't enough charges, is not entirely accurate. The issue is that uh, the new EV drivers are going to the wrong locations or the charges are being put in the wrong locations. There are key differences at the moment between EV charges and petrol stations. As a general rule, your petrol station has a big, well-lit totem outside with the branding, the price, and details of other facilities they may have. Wild Bean Cafe, anyone? With very few exceptions, Charging locations don't have these. I was chatting with a rep from one of the big five CPOs recently, and we talked about why this is. And it all comes down, in the UK at least, to planning consent. As soon as you put something on site over a certain height, it delays the planning permission, often for quite a considerable time. So CPOs are reluctant to do this if they don't have to. The grid serve electric forecourts have adopted that standard for their Braintree and Norwich sites, and the Shell Recharge site at Fulham has done that. Uh, although in fairness, it used to be a petrol station anyway, so there's that planning issue was probably moot in that case. But what this means is that a lot of new EV owners don't know where the charges are. And that's where the podcast sponsors ZapMap come in. Their app identifies and locates every public charger in the country, England, Scotland, Ireland, Wales, and it allows you to navigate there. For most of the larger CPOs, it gives you live status information so that you can tell if the charge is working or not, something that no app can currently provide for petrol stations, by the way which means that finding working charges is relatively easy. I'm also constantly surprised at the number of people who drive petrol or diesel cars and stop on long journeys for a coffee, a pee, some food, some email time, a stretch and a walk, but who think that having to wait for a charge is a bad thing. They don't seem to realize that most EV drivers don't stop for a charge. They stop for something else, just like ICE drivers do, and they charge at the same time. Whereas with fossil fuels, you have to stop for a refill and you can't do anything else while you do it. So their mindset is, 
Fueling is a singular activity that needs 100% of your time and attention, so needs to be done as quickly as possible. They think that charging is the same, and they can't appreciate that this isn't the case. And that's another reason fuel cell vehicle supporters like that method. It aligns with the same mindset. But in reality, given the fact that you can only fill an internal combustion engine car at a petrol station, but you can charge an EV at home, at work, on the motorway, at your local Starbucks, at a restaurant, in a park and ride, at the supermarket, in your local council car park, which one do you think ends up being easier and more convenient? Well, I suppose that all depends on your mindset. It's time for a cool EV or renewable thing to share with your listeners. AI can predict where to put charging stations. BP-backed FreeWire Technologies has just released Mobilize Pro, an AI platform designed with ChargePoint operators in mind. The tools are to best predict the locations to deploy fast charging stations and forecast operational costs and best returns. It leverages AI to combine public and proprietary data sets which feed into tools to predict site utilization, recommend tariffs, and calculate profitability for CPOs. It analyzes charging activity from thousands of public charging locations and correlates it with EV drivers' travel patterns, demographics, and vehicle ownership. This data then helps to predict how many sessions per day will likely occur at new charging locations and at which price. Anyone else find this both cool and scary? Or is that just me? word now from our sponsors about ZapMap Premium, their product for drivers who regularly use the public charge point network. If you charge regularly on the public network, you'll probably be looking for charge points while you're on the go. ZapMap Premium was designed to make this process as simple and stress-free as possible. Seamlessly integrated with your in-car dashboard through Apple CarPlay and Android Auto, it ensures that all the essential details are right at your fingertips. So if you need to find a backup charge stop because your first choice of charger is in use or out of service, or if that traffic jam up ahead changes your plans, ZapMap Premium can show you the way. With enhanced search filters like viewing only newly installed charge points or multi-charger locations, you'll always find the best charging options quickly and easily. You can also access live updates on charger availability on your car dashboard, meaning you're always in the know. What's more, with Premium, you can save unlimited filters, route plans, and EV models, making EV journeys long or short, effortless. ZapMap users can upgrade their experience with ZapMap Premium features by heading to the Subscriptions tab in the app. There's a one-week free trial on offer, so you can give it a test drive. Available for only £2.99 per month, or a cost-effective £29.99 per year, ZapMap Premium makes searching for EV charging points, planning journeys, and paying for charging even simpler. And that's the show for today. Hope you enjoyed listening to it. If you want to contact me, I can be emailed at evmusings at gmail.com. I'm also on Twitter at Musings EV. If you want to support the podcast and newsletter, please consider contributing to becoming an EV Musings patron. The link is in the show notes. Don't want to sign up for something on a monthly basis? If you enjoyed this episode, why not buy me a coffee? Go to ko-fi.com slash EV Musings, and you can do just that. Takes Apple Pay too. I have a couple of ebooks out there if you want to read something on your Kindle. Yo! Got an electric? It's available on Amazon Worldwide for the measly sum of 99p equivalent. It is a great little introduction to living with an electric car. No, oh, you've got renewable. It's also available on Amazon for the same 99p, and it covers installing solar panels, a storage battery, and a heat pump. Why not check them both out? Links for everything we've talked about in the podcast today are in the description. If you've enjoyed this podcast, please subscribe. It's available on iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts. Please leave a review as it helps raise visibility and extend our reach in search engines. If you've reached this part of the podcast and are still listening, thank you. Why not let me know you've got to this point by tweeting me at MusingCV with the word Mind Games, Mindset, Mind Batch. Hashtag if you know you know, nothing else. Thanks, as always, to my co-founder, Simon. You know he's found a good use for the old red phone boxes that used to dot the countryside across the UK. Many people use them as showers or storage sheds or similar. He decided he's going to have one transported to his holiday home in the Maldives, installed on the beach, and fitted with a diamond-encrusted handset that allows him to call his waiter directly to order whatever exotic dish he wants for dinner. 
That is the most expensive phone in the world. Thanks for listening. Bye.